Hello aviation fans, Sky here, and it's been a while since we looked at a large, eminent aircraft. Today we will get acquainted with one of the icons of its time, which although did not become an industry leader, definitely left a mark in history. We are heading to the United Kingdom and meeting probably the coolest creation of Her Majesty's civil aviation industry. Vickers VC-10 is a narrow-body, long-range airliner developed by British Vickers Armstrong's conglomerate in the early 1960s. One of the most advanced airliners of its time and a representative of a special breed of planes that implemented a tail-mounted four-engine power plant, along with its Soviet brother Ilyushin Il-62 and the little Lockheed Jetstar. And so, let's go to the past. The British aviation industry was always very strong, and in the late 1940s it demonstrated its leadership by being the first country to introduce the world to a new generation of revolutionary power plants. The de Havilland Comet became the first jet airliner in history, and Vickers Viscount in turn the first turboprop. This revolution did not avoid tragedies, but the technological capabilities of local aviators were undeniable. Vickers Armstrongs was formed back in the 1920s after the merger of obviously the Vickers and Armstrong Whitworth companies. It was they who lifted the first Vickers Vicon turboprop airliner back in 1948, which was very successful. 445 aircraft were delivered, and in the late 1950s they created its larger air, Vickers Vanguard, comparable in performance with the Il-18 and Lockheed Electra, but this time not gaining popularity. In the military field, these guys were not wasting time as well. The apogee of their work in this direction was one of the three famous V-bombers, the strategic bomber Vickers Valiant. And it became the starting point on the whittling path to the main civilian project. In 1951, just when the Valiant made its first flight, the authorities published a request to create a transport using the experience received from the bomber. It was supposed to be a fairly versatile long-range transport, which moreover could have a civilian version, complementing the successful de Havilland Comet. The series of disasters that brought this success down happened a few years later. The British Air Force was the customer for the transport, and the civilian version was interesting to the BOAC. In 1952, Vickers received the contract for creation of the prototypes, that received the names V-1000 in the military version and Vickers Commercial VC-7 in the civilian. However, the work was being delayed because of a big amount of necessary research and the need to create a new engine. The Avons installed in the bomber did not fit here. The prototype assembly began in 1955, just when, due to the budget optimization, the Air Force decided to abandon the aircraft. Vickers' attempts to find alternative financing were unsuccessful. The BOAC refused to carry the project alone. It was cancelled. In this regard, BOAC's decision is understandable. In the near future, airlines were about to start receiving the latest and most efficient planes, while the domestic aircraft caused a lot of difficulties, making the airline itself uncompetitive. In addition, the Comet disasters and their cancelled operation led to the fact that they lost a hefty piece of fleet and suffered reputational damage. In the end, BOAC ordered the Boeing 707. However, it did not get much easier. The British business model involved active flights to the Middle East, Africa and Asia, while the Boeings were too large, demanding to infrastructure and did not work well with heat and high-altitude airports. Europe and America are good, but what to do in the East? It became obvious that neither Boeing nor Douglas could offer anything suitable, so they decided to do it themselves. Offers came from all major manufacturers, but the most interesting was the concept from Vickers. At the time of the beginning of active work on the project, the engineers already knew what BOAC needed, and it was a serious task. It was necessary to create a fairly large long-haul airliner capable of competing in economy with the American flagships, but at the same time, much more flexible in operation and able to work in more severe conditions. Plus, such capabilities were made keeping the potential military demand in mind. These requirements became the basis for the design of the aircraft called Vickers Commercial VC-10. Given the traffic on the routes intended for the aircraft, making it very large, like the flagships of Boeing and Douglas, was not worth it. The capacity was to be about 150 passengers, 20 to 30 less than that of the Americans. The remaining conditions were on the one hand harsh and requiring serious study, but on the other already familiar to aviators south of the English Channel. 
Yes, the French Sudovetion Caravelle was created for similar conditions, as it had to be able to work in Africa and the Middle East. The plane of course was much smaller than what the British required, but the concept itself was quite appropriate. The basis was accepted. The airliner was to have a low swept wing and engines mounted in the rear of the fuselage. And then the specific designs came in. Firstly, two engines suited the Caravelle fine, but here it was necessary to mount four, without options. The requirements for thrust to weight ratio were high. Other placement options did not fit. To put the engines into the wing was already considered inefficient, and to put them on pylons under the wing was also not optimal. It was dangerous when flying to low quality airfields, and besides there was not enough space for engines in such an arrangement. They didn't want to raise the plane very high, enlarging the landing gear that already required reinforcement. And so we return to the rear engine quad layout, a promising but difficult design. No one had done it before. The engines themselves were already on their way. The work that was started in Rolls-Royce for the V1000 project was implemented in the latest Conway engines. These were the first British turbofans, which at their 100 kN of thrust were quite powerful and economical, and the new reverse mechanisms improved flexibility at airfields. Besides, the rear four engine layout, although requiring structural reinforcement and addition of some elements, turned out to be quite successful. The thrust of these engines, coupled with the qualities of the airframe, was enough to fly at cruising speeds of up to 480 knots, or 900 km per hour, at altitudes about 13 km, or 43,000 feet. These indicators were not stunning for that time, but the range of up to 5,000 miles, or almost 9,500 km, was impressive. Even the two huge American flagships did not learn to jump that far right away. Maintaining engines in such an arrangement was more difficult than motors in individual nacelles, but much easier than the engines inside the wing. Speaking of the wing, one of the main advantages of the rear engine arrangement was the ability to achieve high aerodynamic quality of the wing, free of interfering elements. Vickers engineers put all their effort into it. Along with several research centers in the country, they spent a lot of time to create the most optimal design, allowing to maintain both low takeoff and landing speeds and high crews. They succeeded. With a span of 146 feet and 2 inches (44.55 meters) and an area of 2,851 square feet, the clean swept wing was large enough to create the necessary lift in all flight modes, and the aerodynamic profile was, at that time, the most advanced for aircraft of this class. But beside the dimensions themselves, it received a very developed and complex mechanization. The pretty large flaps have a fowler design, which means they extend from the wing, significantly increasing the lifting force. Plus, the front part of the wing received slats along almost the entire length. Three spoilers were placed on each wing console, every one of which could be controlled individually, giving some flexibility both in flight and on landing. The tail also took a lot of work. The airliner received a T-tail with a rather large increased sweep horizontal stabilizer. This design required an active use of boosters, but improved maneuvering at minimum speeds. Another requirement of low quality runways concerned the landing gear. It had to be able to withstand increased loads. The layout of the gear is standard, three legs. To reduce the risk of damage from lateral loads, the legs were made quite short, so the plane sits pretty close to the ground. The front bogey received two wheels, while the main gears had four. The wheels themselves are also quite large, with slightly reduced pressure, which also improves their ability to swallow bumps, a kind of off-road option. The advantage of the VC-10 over many other aircraft of this layout was the lack of inclination to, you know, fall on its tail. This was achieved by shifting the main landing gear back, which required modification of the tail, but protected the aircraft from excesses. It still failed a couple of times, but usually it was the result of violations in ground handling procedures. Thanks to these solutions, as well as the high thrust ratio, the 150-ton airliner could take off and land from strips up to 8200 feet or 2.5 kilometers long, while the long-haul airliners existing at that time required strips on average 1500 feet longer. Vickers' great pride on the VC-10 was avionics. The aircraft control system was one of the most complex and advanced in the world, and included a highly developed autopilot and functionality that made it possible to land at first by instruments in bad meteorological conditions, and later completely automatically. The most difficult part was the aircraft control complex. 
a duplicated hydraulic system with individual connection to the engines and the use of a decent number of boosters did complicate the design, although simplified the piloting, which could easily be handled by a crew of four people, two pilots, a navigator and a flight engineer. Yes, the task of teaching the aircraft to work in bad conditions was taken by Vickers very seriously. The plane received an oval fuselage with dimensions well fitting the concept of narrow body airliners. In terms of widths, it was almost no different from its peers Boeing 707, DC 8, and Il 62. The aircraft capacities changed from modification to modification. The early models accommodated up to 151 passengers maximum and up to 109 in the usual two class layout. With the creation of the Super VC-10 version, these numbers increased to 139 in two classes and 174 maximum. The layout of the cabins was quite classic, four or six seats in a row, with one aisle. Despite the challenges and revisions, the aircraft was very interesting and promising. BOAC ordered 25 units to fly to difficult destinations. However, already at the stage of preparation for flight tests, the market began to change, pulling the rug from under the future plane. Passenger traffic in aviation was growing at a tremendous pace and a hub transportation system started to take shape, requiring an increasing capacity of airliners. Seeing this, even when creating the basic aircraft, Vickers began work on the version Super 200, with an extended fuselage, boosted engines and a capacity of up to 212 passengers. The aircraft was supposed to conquer the changing industry and compete, first of all, with new versions of the Boeing 707, which were already on the line and quickly capturing the market. The simultaneous creation of not just the complex aircraft, but also its modifications devoured resources of the company, forcing it to request government support. The situation improved, although the Super 200 project had to be greatly simplified. Now the company introduced the basic VC-10 standard type 1100, accommodating up to 151 passengers, and the elongated Super VC-10 type 1150, accommodating up to 174 people. Finally, in June 1962, the VC-10 prototype made its maiden flight. As part of the tests, three machines performed hundreds of flights and many changes were made to the design. Certification lasted until 1964, when the operation finally began. Then another seemingly unrelated factor started pressing on the newborn VC-10, the decolonization. The empire on which the sun never sets was reducing its colonial territories. Ironically, the VC-10 was being created primarily for flights to dominions in Africa, the Middle East and Asia, and now the demand for them started to decline. The BOAC simply had no need for a big VC-10 fleet. In addition, the decrease in flights to the east had shifted the priorities of airlines, now trying to increase their shares in Europe and on transatlantic flights. And there the big American airliners, which had already undergone many modifications, were feeling much better. Besides, most destinations began to receive more developed airports with good infrastructures. The flight advantages of the VC-10 became insignificant and the cost of their operation turned out to be higher than the more demanding but also more capacious American airliners, the popularity of which often made the operation even easier. As a result, the main customer of the aircraft, BOAC, clearly preferred the Boeing 707, and to all the complaints they answered simply that they were a commercial airline, not a charitable foundation, and if Vickers wanted to compete in the market, they have to make the aircraft more efficient. This was pretty ironic, given that most of the aircraft's specifications, which now turned out to be useless, were initially formed precisely in accordance with the wishes of BOAC. Vickers, then already a part of the United British Aircraft Corporation, or BAC, placed their bets on the Super VC-10. In the new conditions, the large capacity made it more efficient. In the first year of operation, 12 basic VC-10 were delivered, and until 1969, 17 more Super VC-10s joined them. These aircraft were adored by both the crews, who were proud of the aircraft with incomparable technology and capabilities, and the passengers, who received a high level of comfort and speed. The brainchild of Vickers became the fastest civilian plane performing transatlantic flights. Its record was broken only by the Concorde. It even got to the point where people would specifically customize their travel plans to get on a flight performed by the Vickers. BOAC actively operated the planes, although facing many problems. In the very first years of flight, it became clear that the aircraft was too complex and some of its functions were unnecessary. 
At first, they got rid of the reverse thrust systems on internal engines already installed on the early liners. Then it turned out that the advanced automatic landing system was almost never used. Pilots didn't trust the autopilot completely. The topic of flight automation is controversial even now, and in the 1960s it seemed almost a heresy. Besides, while in England and Northern Europe it was often foggy and the system could be used, in the southern regions it was not necessary at all. The former colonies, as much as they could, also operated the planes that went to the fleets of several airlines in Africa and the Middle East, although their numbers of course were very modest. In the beginning, carriers from Eastern Europe and China were also interested, but after some time they took to their fleets the Soviet Il-62. Vickers could barely support the production of airliners that failed to become massive. Many projects of modernization, the creation of a transport aircraft and even double-deck models were never implemented. There was not enough resources for this work. The competitors were moving forward, while the British started to lag. The Vickers planes were more difficult to maintain, the bigger mass of the structure caused higher fuel consumption with a lower capacity, and the noise level with the development of aviation was already too high. Flexibility in working with poor airfields was not in great demand. Smaller and simpler planes were flying there. The VC-10 military service was more successful. The aircraft flying in the Royal Air Force fleet were a modification of the VC-10 with booster engines, additional fuel tanks and the possibility of aerial refueling. They began deliveries in 1965 and were actively operated. In the late 1970s, British aerospace took up modification of the aircraft and the creation of aerial tankers on their bases. In total, from 1962 to 1970, 54 Vickers VC-10 aircraft of several major modifications were built. Probably the most advanced purely British airliner fell victim to concept errors, political clashes and fierce competition. But despite the failure, the plane confirmed its reliability. Some disasters involving the airliners were the result of human errors. Besides, we should take into account the areas where they were operated. Most of the losses were the result of either the military conflicts or terrorist attacks and hijacks. The BOAC's successor, British Airways, started decommissioning the airliners in 1974. The planes were leased to other carriers or modified and transferred to the Royal Air Fleet. Technically, the VC-10 was flying actively with some other airlines, but by the beginning of the 1980s they began to lose those positions too. In the end, in the early 1990s, the airliners were either in the military, in museums or in the aircraft graveyards. In the military format, the VC-10 served in the Royal Air Force until the beginning of the 21st century, participating in many operations. But this could not last forever. The fleet modernization program has replaced both the VC-10 and Lockheed TriStar with the new Airbus A330 MRTT aerial tanker. Operations ended in 2013. Vickers VC-10 can be considered an example of an aircraft design that is too complex. Technically, the airliner can be seen as a miracle of engineering, many solutions of which were ahead of their time. On the other hand, the phrase ahead of its time is a polite version of the phrase in over its head. Many of the solutions were too complicated, the transportation industry was not ready for them. And considering the changes in aviation, well, the VC-10 did not become a victory, although it still remains a legend. On this dramatic note, let's finish today's story. Comment below what you think about this epic airplane. Fast flights and soft landings to you.